welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Sunday, September the 27th, 2020. Seven days was all she knows. Kind of all to make her know. Well, staying it's not exactly seven days. It is 37 voting days until November 3rd. The last day to vote in the 2020 general election. And we have a unique opportunity to vote early. The topic today is getting out and voting early. Also the Supreme Court and what's at stake and the way the media is behaving, the corporate news media in covering Donald Trump. All of that next. Thirty-seven, twenty-seven, fifty. <laughs> no, those are not. Those are not measurements. That uh, those aren't body measurements. Those are thirty-seven voting days until the November third general election. Twenty-seven states are currently voting in person or early voting by mail. That's more than half the states. And 50, as in 50 states in the Union. Voting is so critical now, and there really is little left to say other than to vote early. If you are in an early voting state right now, and pretty soon all 50 states will with maybe a couple of exceptions, will have begun the voting process prior to the November 3rd election day itself. And because of the pandemic that we currently are struggling through, the election day, as it were, becomes a two-month process. It is not just November 3rd. November 3rd is the last day of the election itself. The actual election began in earnest on September the 4th when North Carolina began mailing out its ballots to voters who are registered. Now, I want to make this very clear. The only people who receive ballots through the mail automatically because of this pandemic are people who are already registered to vote. That is something that I am going to continue to emphasize on this podcast because there is too much lying going on. <laughs> There's not just lying going on. It's going on everywhere. And you heard yesterday the Arizona Secretary of State on this podcast, Katie Hobbs, talking about the process in Arizona in terms of ballots, in terms of everything. And she put to bed a lot of these lies, all of these lies that are being told by Donald Trump and others. And I'm going to do the same. And I think everybody who has a podcast or has a social media um, channel or whatever it might be should be repeating this every chance they get. The only people who get ballots sent to them in this pandemic are people who have already registered to vote. Ballots are not just sent to anybody. Ballots are only sent to registered voters. So what we have now is an election that really began, as I said, on September 4th with the North Carolina vote and the fact that the ballots were mailed out in North Carolina on Friday, September 4th. We've seen record numbers of ballot requests and they continue to go on. We're seeing in places like Michigan over 2.1 million requests and counting. We're seeing the same thing in Pennsylvania. People are voting early and people are voting in person early. 
And the pandemic is a major reason why, but also something that we have heard from some people who have been talked, who have been interviewed about this, is that they are voting because they have some questions about the post office. But no matter what the reason is, there is unprecedented turnout happening in this country so far. We're seeing it in Illinois with these long lines there. We're seeing it in suburban Illinois. We're seeing it within the cities in the state of Illinois. We're seeing this in places like Virginia. We're seeing this in other places where there is early in-person voting. We're seeing this in Alabama as well to a degree. So there are places now where there is a lot of in-person early voting. And as I said, 37, 27, 50. 37 more voting days. 27 states currently voting early, whether that is in person or by mail. And the 50 states of this country, the United States of America. I'm actually going to outline to you all the states that are currently, as of this day, Sunday, September 27th, 2020, voting right now. Here are the states that are voting right now, early voting in person. And if you are in one of these states, please make sure that you have voted if you haven't already done so. Because early voting, as I have said, is the key to this election. Early voting is going to be the thing that I think will put Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House. I really do think that's going to happen. And I really do think the only way it can happen is if it is done by a landslide. There must be unprecedented voter turnout in this early voting period. I could not stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. There must be unprecedented voter turnout in this early voting season. If you want to see a change in the White House in terms of who occupies the White House beginning January the 20th, 2021 then you really must vote early and I urge you to do that and I urge you to do that right now if you haven't here are the early voting states right now first of all the ones where people are voting in person Virginia Alabama Wyoming Minnesota, Michigan, Georgia, Vermont, South Dakota, Illinois. Those are the nine states that are early voting in person right now. And in some of those states, There have been reports of long lines. I've seen some of the news reports in Virginia and in in other places. Illinois, as I just mentioned, where there are long lines. And on the first day of early voting in Illinois, just like in Virginia the week before, long lines in various parts of the state. Now, of course, we don't know exactly how all of those individuals have voted or are going to vote or had voted, but we will certainly find out in the days after November 3rd. And before I get to the states voting early by mail, it's also important, and I'll get to this a bit later on, that the news media does its due diligence and exercises maximum responsibility in terms of how they are reporting on the results of this election. So this is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Do you hear that alarm, that siren? That siren is literally telling you 
that it is time for you to early vote and to do that now. Please do that now. If you are in any of those states that I just read out in the early voting in person category, please make sure you mosey on down to your local precinct. I've got links to all of the precincts in terms of the counties, I should say, the county board of elections places in every state. They're called different things, as I've said before. But please make sure that if you are in Virginia or Alabama or Wyoming or Minnesota or Michigan or Georgia or Vermont or South Dakota or Illinois, and you happen to be listening to this and you haven't voted yet, please get out there and early vote in person. I know that there's a pandemic Make sure that you have a plan to do that, to vote, whether you do it early in person or if you do it by mail. In which case, make sure that you return your ballot immediately. In fact, I would be returning my ballot and by dropping it off either in a drop box or going to the local county board of elections and dropping it off with them. That's the strategy that I would be employing right now. So those are the early voting in-person states as of this date, September 27th, 2020. Now I'm going to read you the states voting by mail right now. And all of these states are the ones where they are actually either returning the ballots by the U.S. Postal Service or they are doing what I just suggested, which was dropping them off at a drop box or going to their local county board of elections place and dropping it off there. So these are the these are the states that are voting by mail early right now. Arkansas, Alaska, Nevada, Idaho, North Dakota, New York, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, Missouri, Wisconsin, Mississippi, North Carolina, West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Maryland. Those are the 18 states that as of today have already been voting by mail. They are voting by mail right now. If you are in any of those states that I just read out and you have not yet sent in your ballot, please make sure you do that today. I mean, literally. I know it's Sunday. As I record this, it's Sunday, September 27th, 2020. But I really urge you not to hesitate, not to procrastinate. Sunday, heck, this is a really good day to do this. Because you can fill out your ballot. Make sure you pay very close attention to the voting rules in your state. And make sure you fill out your ballot properly. Make sure that you put them in the proper envelope and all of those kinds of things which are very important. And once you do that, make sure you either drop it off at a drop box or drop it off at your county board of elections or your municipal clerk's office or whichever office it might be. I have links to that on my uh, voting list, which I am updating daily. I'm going to be updating some more. Actually, um, by the time you listen to this episode, there will be some additional updates that you may or may not notice, but you can procure that list that I have put together either on Twitter as a pinned tweet on my account at the popcorn R E E L. Or if you wish, you can check the liner notes of this episode or any other episode over the last few weeks, because I do have a link to the voting list that has links to all 50 election commissions slash secretaries of state and links to voter registration deadlines, links to checking your voter registration, links to requesting an absentee ballot, 
and that will continue to be updated where where necessary on a daily basis. So that is really important for people um, who are listening to this podcast episode here inside the United States. And if you are an overseas voter, um, make sure that you pay attention to the um, applicable rules as well. So uh, I will come back actually and give a website for overseas voters. So if you are listening to this episode in another country and you are registered to vote, but you're overseas, there are rules in case you are not aware of those rules. Um, I can tell you and I will direct you to a website that you can go to about that. Coming up in the, in a few moments, I will talk about that um, very briefly. So the call is on. The clarion call goes out. We are 37 more voting days. We have 37 voting days. Can you believe that literally a month or so ago, if not a little bit more than that, I would just say, about two months ago, we were talking about 100 days. We were talking, you know, two months ago, about 100 days until the election. Now, we are now 37 days away. But it's important to emphasize 37 voting days. We have 37 voting days until November 3rd. And what I would suggest to you, what I would strongly recommend, I strongly advise that if you are in one of those 27 states that I have read out, that you vote in person if it is available to you. And obviously, I read out nine states at this day, as of this day, which are allowing early in-person voting. Or you can go vote by mail, which is the other 18 states. If you live in one of those 18 states that I just read out, you can vote by mail and do so right away. But optimally, my strongest recommendation with a pandemic, even with a pandemic, and take you take your safeguards, and that's very important. My strongest recommendation would be that you vote in person and early. And I say that, I've said it before here, but I'm going to say it again. Because the reason why I strongly advise you to do that is that you get to see your vote literally being put in a box. Or you can get to put your vote in the box or in wherever you put your vote because it's different in different states. You get to do that um, and you get to see it processed or you at least get to see it go through. And you can track your ballot. You can literally track your ballot in almost every state. In fact, what you will find on the voter guide that I have put together is links to that in almost every state. And I will continue to update that as well. And you will see there will be links to tracking your ballot. So literally, you will be able to track your ballot. You oversee that process yourself. And as the Arizona Secretary of State said yesterday in yesterday's episode, these things are thoroughly secured. Arizona's process, I am actually very impressed with. And I said to the secretary um, that, you know, the website is really good. The process is very good. This is Arizona is a state that is a Republican state. I mean, it's a state where people largely vote Republican. There have been some, you know, you know, but it's, it's mostly a Republican state. Although we're seeing lots of uh, details that suggest that it may not be or that it's going to be closer. But Arizona has been reliably Republican. It's got two Republican senators, maybe not for much longer, though, because we're seeing that Mark Kelly is doing extraordinarily well right now with just over a month left. You know, we'll see. Martha McSally is is seemingly on her way out. But I shouldn't say I I need to correct myself, you know, (laughs) because Arizona does not have two Republican senators. (laughs) See, I actually fact, I fact checked and corrected myself in real time. (laughs) I knew almost 10, almost three seconds after I ended that sentence, I knew that I was, that I was wrong because of course, Kirsten Sinema, a Democrat, (laughs) Kirsten Sinema, a Democrat is, (laughs) is one of the two senators that Arizona already has. 
She defeated Martha McSally. And what happened was, is that there was a vacancy in the other Senate seat in the state of Arizona due to the passing of John McCain, the Republican senator who had held that seat for many a year. And so there was a special election. Um, not a special election. There was a, a vacancy. And what happened was, is that the governor of Arizona, and I forget if it was Doug Ducey or if it was Jan Brewer at the time. Um, it may have been Jan Brewer. I do not remember. But the point is, is that the governor of Arizona appointed the person who would finish out the rest of uh, the late Senator McCain's term. And that person who was appointed was Martha McSally. So Martha McSally literally went from losing her Senate seat in Arizona in 2018 to Kirsten Cinema in an election that was very close, by the way. And that took days and days to decide. So, you know, this idea that all oh, the elections got to be decided, you know, on, on November 3rd is a bunch of nonsense. That's for media. And that's for people like Donald Trump who lie, who tell you that it's got to be decided on that day. An election has never been a, a decided on election day ever. When you hear the media saying that that has happened, what they are doing is they are going off projections. They are going off exit polling. They are going off a percentage of a, proje a, proje a projected total based on what the returns are or based on what the early voting is or based on what exit polls are. They are not, this is not the final count. In all of these states, the vote count is still going on. I mean, this happened here. A great example of this, by the way, is California, where this year in the Democratic primary back in March on the Super Tuesday, on Super Tuesday which is on March the 3rd of this year, 2020. Bernie Sanders had been leading Joe Biden by an awful lot. It had been a, about an eight percentage point lead for Bernie. But there had only been something like 60 or 70 percent of the vote counted. And the networks could have done what they always do is project Bernie Sanders the winner. But they did not. And again, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. The primaries are in the rearview mirror now, so I'm not going to go relitigate that. But what networks customarily do is project the winners and for lots of reasons that I'm not going to rehash here, the corporate news media decided not to, not to call that race out West here um, in California. And we didn't get to find out who confirmed. And everybody knew that Bernie had won the state. I mean, he had won the state. He had a, a large lead. There was 60 to 70% of the vote cast but yet the networks weren't calling it, right? And like I say, I don't want to go into all that again. But this is what customarily happens. And we didn't find out the result officially in California until about nearly two weeks later, if not three, because they were still counting votes. And that's the reality of what happens in every presidential election. Votes still get counted. Same thing happened in New York with the race between Carolyn Maloney and a progressive. Forget the gentleman's name now. And Donald Trump lies and says, oh, well, you know, there's, uh, there's rigged. It's, no, it's not. It's garbage. It's not rigged. The only person who is rigging anything is Donald Trump because that's, why, that's, the, why, that's the reason he mentions that word so often because it's on his brain because he's doing that because the Republicans are doing it. But that race in, in New York, that congressional race, Carolyn Maloney ended up winning it. It took some six weeks or so to count and decide everything because there were so many ballots being cast. And there was a change in the uh, uh, rules in terms of the state decided to, I think it was, um, have some absentee ballot voting for the first time. And because of the pandemic, and I don't know all the specifics at the moment on the top of my head, but the point is, there was so many people casting these ballots and these early ballots or absentee ballots for the first time in New York because New York did not, does not ordinarily have early voting. 
New York has in-person voting day of, but they've changed that rule. And the rule change took effect for this particular uh, primary that took place in June, in fact, the end of June. And we didn't get the results of that primary until I think early August or late July, if I remember correctly. So it was around early August, you know, almost six weeks later before we really got to um, find out who the winner was. And that's not because there was any chicanery going on. It was because the voting, you know, the infrastructure, which needs to be boosted, which is what the House Democrats have done. They passed these laws preserving uh, election security, you know, and giving all this money to states to invest in the infrastructure of voting. And because all these states don't have the strongest of infrastructures in terms of the money, some states are very good. Arizona is very good with this. And as I said, the Secretary of State there, Katie Hobbs, talked about the kinds of measures and detailed security measures and integrity measures that Arizona has. And it's really, I think Arizona's is one of the best in the country. There are others, and they're all really around the Pacific states. Washington's is very good. Oregon's is very good. In particular, those two are very, very strong. But but what I'm getting at here is the New York race took so long to count because, again, they were flooded. They were flooded with the amount of ballots that they were getting. Absentee. And it took forever to count. And that's what that was. And I think then there was a challenge to it, I think. And then there had to be, I mean, it took a little while before we found out what was going on. Now, the, the, now the thing is, the obvious thing is, we need to make sure that there is enough money in the congressional budgets to, and there is, but of course the Senate is not passing those bills that Pelosi in the House and the Democrats in the House have passed. But but that money needs to be given to these states. So the Senate needs to get off its rusty behind and pass these things. Of course, they're not going to. Mitch McConnell blocked two election protection bills that the House had. He blocked them last year. But that's the point. The point is, is that these states need that money. So you won't have five or six weeks of New York voting, you know, New York counting votes. But that's why there's something called a safe harbor harbor provision, which gives states a full month. December 8th, I think, is the first deadline. And then I think December 11th is the second for states to finish their counts, to complete their count and certify their counts. And then, of course, what happens is that on the first Monday or Tuesday of the new Senate session, the new House session, The House comes together to certify those counts and officially enumerate them in the Electoral College. That happens in January, in the first week of January. That's why we have the safe... See, this is the thing. When you don't have people educating you, especially in the media, which I'll get to in a few minutes, but when you don't have people educating you, You don't know. And then you have some liar like Donald Trump lying to you. And because you may not know what the real rules are, you believe everything he says. So his lie is left hanging in the air like that. Meanwhile, maybe you're not going to research it. Maybe you've got too many other more important things in your life that are going on. So, heck, I'm not going to bother researching what it is. Maybe you don't have internet access, so you don't know. Maybe you don't have a laptop access. You don't have a computer. Maybe. You can't go to your local library because perhaps your local library is closed because of the pandemic. So how, so how do you get the information? Do you call somebody and ask them, how do you get the information? So that lie just lingers, 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 unchallenged. Well, that's why there are people out here who care enough to provide the information for you. And there are people that need to do that in the media, and I'll get to that. 
But all of this is to get back to my point. Which is that it is very important that you vote early in person. And a place like Arizona could have two Democratic senators. It's very possible that it's going to happen. Martha McSally, who, as I said, got that seat because it was a special election to fill out the rest of John McCain's term, which would have ended or which ends in January. Martha McSally is on her right way out. I mean... She's going to lose that. I think she's going to lose that election to Mark Kelly. Mark Kelly's fundraising has been incredible. His advertising has been incredible. Um, Mark Kelly's an astronaut. He spent a year up in space by himself. Yes, he has a twin brother as well. Uh, Mark Kelly is the husband of former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, who you know what happened to her. Just very horrible. Very horrible with guns and some white racist male decided to brandish a gun and shoot at people and he struck. Well, I mean, this is just horrible. I, I, and affected and changed um, Congresswoman Gifford's career and life. Um, but she is actually a very good leader. I mean... Um, Gun violence is another thing I'm going to be talking about because I'm going to get back to issues. Remember, um, I started last week talking about health care and where these two people stand on it. These two people being Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I'm going to get back to issues again here um, this week because, of course, there's a debate coming up. But I just want to get right back to Arizona. It looks like there's going to be two Democratic senators there. I think there will be. Um, I think that um, Kirsten Sinema, well, Kirsten Sinema is not up for re-election yet, but she will hold her seat, obviously, because she's not up for re-election yet. And I think that Mark Kelly, Captain Mark Kelly, who, as I said, is an astronaut, um, was up in space for a whole year alone. Incredible. And, you know, um, is the husband of Gabrielle Giffords, the former congresswoman, who's doing some great work um, in combating um, the NRA and advocating for gun sense and gun safety laws and background check laws that are strong and loophole uh, laws that are closing the loopholes of these gun gun shows. Um, it looks like Captain Mark Kelly is going to be um, a senator and he's a Democrat. So I should kind of uh, pull back on saying Arizona is this um, bastion of Republicans. I mean, it does lean more that way, but we could be seeing two Democratic senators in Arizona, and I don't know when the last time that ever happened was. I should have asked that of Secretary Hobbs um, in Arizona, but um, the point I'm making with all of this is vote early, okay? Vote early, vote early in person especially, because I think that is very important. And if you are a little skittish about it, I can understand, but please, I would strongly advise you to do so in person. Mask, gloves, physical distancing. I strongly recommend that you do that. 27 states are voting early. And they are voting early right now as I speak. So certainly if you are in one of those 27 states, you have either received or are going to be receiving very soon your mail-in ballot. Or you have early voted in person or will do so. And I urge you to do that if you haven't yet, to do it immediately, really. Um... Do not wait. Do not wait. Do this right now because the earlier you vote, the better. It really is the truth. The earlier you vote, the better off. I'm telling you, you do not want to wait until November 3rd. 
I would strongly advise you that if you are currently in an early voting state, and even if that early voting state has not begun its early voting process yet, I would strongly advise you to plan now, right now, to early vote in person. Or if you're skittish about early voting in person, make sure that you have a plan that you're looking at your prospective ballot, which is online. I have links to these things. And you can get an idea of what that ballot looks like. You can look at the choices, make your plan. And when the ballot comes, you know what to do. Fill it out carefully. Make sure you sign it. All these things carefully. Use the envelopes carefully. Make sure you do the right thing with that. And then drop it off at a drop box or drop it off back at your local county board of elections. It's really important in your local office, whichever that is. It's really important. Welcome back. And one thing before I get on to the topic of the Supreme Court. It is, I think, very important to understand one thing. We are still in the pandemic. It is very important to wear a mask. Please wear a mask. And as you can perhaps hear that barking dog I think that dog is also asserting a level of agreement with my sentiment this pandemic continues over 206,000 people in the United States have died from the coronavirus and from Donald Trump's murderous hands Now, I know that Joe Biden will not say this at the debate on Tuesday, but that is exactly what has happened. The media won't say it because anyone who knew on February 7th of this year that this was a very deadly, dangerous virus. And he said so and told Bob Woodward this on tape while lying to us and telling us publicly that, no, this isn't a big deal. It's going to go away by April is someone who's guilty of murder and should be brought up in front of the Hague, brought up in the Hague for charges of crimes against humanity and mass murder and genocide. I mean, no one wants to really say that or deal with it because it seems like, oh my goodness, oh my God, how could you? But the fact of the matter is, is that it's not just that Donald Trump lied. It's that Donald Trump knew He knew. I mean, if you slip something into someone's drink and you know that that drug that you're slipping into their drink incapacitates them. That's not that's not you just being negligent. That's that's beyond negligence. That's beyond criminal negligence. Whatever happens to that person who drinks that drink is what the person who puts the pill or drug of choice into that drink becomes guilty of if a jury of that person's peers renders a verdict as such. But that would be the result. It wouldn't just be, oh, he's negligent or incompetent. That would not be the thing. So we must stop calling mass murderers negligent people. Because they are not negligent people. And people still bristle when I say things like what I'm about to say. Which is, I think, because, I mean, this guy is a psychopath. And I think that this was part of his strategy to try to stay in the White House, was to kill as many people as possible with this virus. Now, it's not his virus. He didn't bring it into the country, but he spread it throughout the country with his behavior, with his not wearing a mask on 
March the 11th and giving that speech. With him giving that speech in the Oval Office on March 11th and not saying anything about wearing a mask. He should have given that speech on February 7th when he told Bob Woodward on audio that this was a very bad thing. No, Bob, this is very bad. This is deadly. This is dangerous. This is very bad. But he spoke to us a month later in public and in the Oval Office and didn't say anything about masks, didn't say anything about how dangerous this virus was. That ain't some simple negligence or incompetence. That is willful. I've said it all along. I've said it on social media. That is deliberate. And I'm telling you, my opinion is is that was his strategy. Because, hey, what's 200,000 people? If I can get rid of them and more, heck, that's 200,000 less people that will vote against me. Heck, I mean... His cards are so transparent. Just a week or two ago, he said, well, if it wasn't for the blue states, if it wasn't for the blue states and the people who died in the blue states, then uh, we'd be doing very well. If you don't think that those two things, what I just said about what I think his re-election strategy was in part, and him actually saying that if it wasn't for those blue states, don't have some kind of connection, if you don't think I'm on to something, I think I think you really should think again. This guy is a sociopath. He is a psychopath. His niece has told you that this guy is an absolute threat to the country. And she's not the only one who's told you this, Mary Trump. There are others who have and have been telling you that for a long time. Hillary Clinton told you that This was a very dangerous thing to do to put this guy in the White House. She told you that during the debates that she had with this guy. And that Putin would be controlling every move. And we're seeing that that's the case. He's repeating the talking points from Russia. CNN did a really good comparison on this recently. So that's what I want to just say for the these last six minutes I've been talking. I I just want to say those things. Wear a mask. And know that this guy who's running is someone who is a psychopath and a sociopath. And I'll get to the media in a few short minutes. But first, I want to talk about the Supreme Court. Yesterday, of course, Amy Coney Barrett was announced as the nominee of Donald Trump. And people have been going back and forth about this. Look, this is not about whether or not Amy Coney Barrett, who is a judge on the federal circuit court, or district circuit court, or circuit, whatever. She is a federal court judge. <laughs> Just put it that way. Um, she's been there for barely a year or two. This is not about whether or not she's nice. <laughs> And I, look, Democrats, look, a lot of Senate, Senate Democrats are saying that they are not going to sh- talk to her. OK, fine. Well and good. Some people say, well, what's the point of that? I say, yeah, I think they should do it. And it's not just symbolic. I know some people say, well, oh, that's just symbolic. Well, yeah, it, yeah, it is. But also it is to send a message um, as well to not just the Republicans, but to American voters is that. You know, it is symbolic in that way, but they want to send a message to voters that they are fighting, that they're doing things. And yes, it may be a a performative gesture in some in some way, shape or form for some. But 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 here, hear this. This is this is something that is really important because the Republicans weren't performing. Four years ago, see, this is the trap that I think some of us fall into. Some may see this as a performative gesture. Oh, well, we're not going to hear her. We're not going to talk to, excuse me, we're not going to talk to her. We're not going to meet with her. We're not going to do that. And some of us have already, some of that, some of the Senate Dems, Chuck Schumer, has said that he's not even going to vote for her. He's already said that. He's made it very clear. The other, some of the other Senate Dems are a bit more, well, you know, but it's obvious they're not going to vote for her. 
Who's going to vote for someone who wants to get rid of Obamacare, who chastised, on the record, chastised Justice John Roberts, hardly a paragon of, of liberalism, that he should not have sided with this, uh, with the four liberals on the court in the U.S. Supreme Court on Obamacare. He shouldn't have joined them. This is not about a performance. Because no one's calling what Mitch McConnell did a performance four years ago. They are calling it skullduggery. They are calling it a theft of a U.S. Supreme Court seat. Which is, act, which is exactly what it was. Nobody is calling Mitch McConnell and what Mitch McConnell did four years ago a performance or symbolic. They are calling it skullduggery because that's exactly what it was, a theft, a complete theft. Nobody is calling Mitch McConnell and what he did four years ago a performance. No one is calling him and what he did four years ago some kind of symbolic gesture. They are calling it the theft of a Supreme Court seat, which is exactly what it was. It was the theft of a Supreme Court seat. Article 1 of the Constitution mandates, mandates that the Senate must advise and cons- they must engage in advice and consent. Now, the advising is principally done um, through debates. And the consent is done through the vote of the Senate. Advice and consent. There was none of that for Merrick Garland four years ago when Barack Obama was the president. There was none of that. There was none of the advice and consent. That's a violation of the constitutional oath. But you see, the thing is, nobody cares about, well, some people do. The thing is, Republicans do not care about the Constitution. They can quote texts and claim originality and originalism all they want. But when it comes to procedural matters and when it comes to downright governing, they don't believe in the Constitution because they violate it. Mitch McConnell violated his constitutional oath. He violated his Article 1 responsibilities four years ago. Nobody called that a performance. But when Democrats do it, oh, it's a performance. No, it's not. This is very important what the Democrats are doing. Some people say, oh, it's symbolic. And maybe, 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 I, maybe I would say that it is. And I just said earlier, well, maybe there is some symbolism to it. There is, perhaps. There is symbolism to it. But, but I think this is deeper than that. This is about trying to fight back against what is probably going to be a sixth conservative on the Supreme Court. But stranger things have happened in this country. Stranger things have happened. And to go back to Amy Coney Bryant, uh, excuse me, Amy Coney Barrett. Oh my goodness. I am just mixing up everything. I, I could have said Coney Island. I mean, I'm just mixing up everything. This pandemic scrambles your brain, um, among other things. I mean, it's it, <laughs> it, it, no, it, it just scrambles your brain. It doesn't do anything else except the trauma and pain that people have been feeling and the helplessness, I think, and the despair. And it's difficult. Uh, I don't want to sidestep any of those things. Um, but we cannot afford to stay fixed in despair. Um, now, if you are suffering from clinical depression, um, then what I have to say will have no relevance. In fact, it, it would probably come off as very insensitive um, because clinical depression is very serious. Um, but for people who are not experiencing depression on that level, at least, um, it's really important to get out there and vote. I want to reemphasize that. But on to, again, Amy Coney Barrett, who um, it has been named now as the nominee to be considered. The Republicans are trying to ram this through 
October 12th is where they intend to start hearings and all of this kind of stuff. Um, Democrats do have in the Senate tools that they can use um, to slow this all down. Uh, We'll see what tools they use. We'll see um, what tricks they will use. But it's just so unseemly, obviously, that this is being done now. But the reason why it's being done now is because the Republicans have power. I mean, that's really the chief overarching reason. Now, the obvious reasons are to get rid of Roe v. Wade, to get rid of Obamacare, to get rid of labor rights and to turn this country into a right to work country. And right to work is a very deceptive term. It doesn't mean you can get to work. You have a job. You have a job. You have a job. You have a job. This is not Oprah we're talking about here with all the greatest respects for for Oprah Winfrey. This is about, right to work is about stripping away unions. There are already right to work states like Indiana and other states, mostly in Republican territories, where people do not have labor unions representing them. Or if they do, they can face harsh fines and they can face all kinds of penalties, including, I think, jail, perhaps. And what Judge Barrett wants to do is squash unions. So that's what Brett Kavanaugh wants to do. Now Brett Kavanaugh and co. have enough votes. Mitch McConnell and co. have enough votes. Donald Trump and co. have enough votes. The Republicans have enough votes to do these things if Amy Coney Barrett gets on the court. And I don't think we should be painting this as an air of inevitability, by the way. Because there's things that you and I can do. We can call Republican senators. And we must call them. 202-225-3121. We can do that today. And we should call them on a daily basis. And just because Mitt Romney says, well, you know, I think we should have a vote on the nominee before the election. that, That doesn't mean that you just don't call these Republicans anymore. Keep calling these people. Even though they've already said what they've said. Call them. Pressure them. I mean, my goodness. In 2000, you had these rich Tom DeLay bust in, Brett Kavanaugh assisted, and others assisted people who were banging on the doors of vote counting places in Palm Beach County and other counties in Florida. I think it was Palm Beach. These are Democratic counties, by the way. And so you had these a busload of these Republican operatives and people acting as if they are some kind of populists banging on the doors of the vote count places in Palm Beach County, Florida. This is a true story. You can go check this out on YouTube. You can check this out anywhere. You can search it online. There's even a portion of the video of them doing it in the opening few minutes of Michael Moore's film Fahrenheit 9-11 from 2004. In the first five minutes or so, there's, there's a video, there's video of them banging on the doors. This is, you want to talk about a performance. Although, again, that's the Republicans. But, you know, they're not performing. They are doing this for real. And I think it becomes a matter of semantics when we start to say, well, is it a performance or is it not? They're doing it. This is the same thing I said earlier in in previous episodes, rather, about the whole rigmarole around, well, is Donald Trump performing fascism or is he actually doing it? I mean... You know, I'm sorry, but only rich people get to ask. You know, only rich people are the ones who ask those kinds of questions, right? Right? Poor people and people who are from the working class or from the middle class do not have the luxury of posing questions like this. Well, is he doing it for a performance or is he real? The fact is he's doing this for real, if you really must know. And at some point, calling it a performance versus not engages in really semantical behavior because the fact is it's happening right before us. You tell some poor sod down the street, down on on her luck, whether or not 
this guy in the White House is performing or not. I don't think they give a go- good goddamn, by the way. But again, with Amy Coney Barrett, the thing is not whether she's nice, whether she's, whether she's intelligent, whether she's clerked, whether she's been a judge. That's not what's at issue here. The issue is, what are her opinions? What are her rulings? What are her opinions? That is what the issue is. And her opinions are that she is not a fan of Roe v. Wade. Her opinions are that she would love. She hasn't said it like this, but I'm saying it like this. She is no fan of Obamacare. She'd love to get rid of it. The the Affordable Care Act, same thing. And she is the arch enemy of Roe v. Wade. She's the arch enemy of Roe v. Wade. As I said, she wants to get rid of it. Labor unions, she's not in favor of uh, marriage for everybody. Only marriage for straight people like me or you. Or if, if you're someone who is a member of the LGBTQIA community, she doesn't, she doesn't want you to marry. She doesn't want you to marry. If you're listening to this right now and you're a member of the LGBTQIA community, she does not want you to marry. This has got nothing to do with whether she's a decent person or whether she's not. It has nothing to do with whether she's adopted the black kids or not. That, that is not the, <laughs> this is not the issue. We love optics in this country. There is a book you have to read. It's called this, this is a really important book. And it's by Guy Debord. And he talks about the Society of Spectacle. That's the name of the book, The Society of the Spectacle. That we are enthralled with spectacle and optics and what things look like. And, and that is really something that America does indulge in. The, this idea of optics. Oh, and she's there with her family and... Oh, and isn't she great? Or isn't he great? His wife is there or her husband is there. And ooh, they've adopted these two kids from Haiti. Isn't that lovely? And listen to me, listen. This is not about who she's adopted, who she hasn't, how many kids she has or doesn't have. That is not what's at issue here. This isn't about her personality. It isn't about whether she's intelligent or even if she's qualified, quite frankly. This is about her stands on the issues that affect you, me, your family, and other families all across this country. That's what this is about. And these issues will affect you, your parents, your kids, your grandkids for generations. Now, your parents for certainly a good while to come. But for your kids and your grandkids. Amy Coney Barrett is 48 years of age. Now, I don't normally talk about people's ages. I mean, I've mentioned them. But the reason why I mention hers, and I know it's rude to uh, speak about women's ages. It's not, it's not a very uh, polite or nice thing to do. And, uh, you know, there's a certain level of decency that is important. That, is, that I think is important, quite frankly. Um, and I'm, I'm not the only one, but, but this is, since I'm speaking on my own podcast here, um, I'm going to toot my horn about that. I think that's, that's critical. We have to be more decent toward each other. Um, yes, there's times where we get upset about things, but overall, um, decency is important. And I think this election is going to be won on that, by the way, certainly in the long term and certainly on November 3rd, 4th, 5th, 10th. But this is Amy Coney Barrett is 48. She, if she is voted onto the Supreme Court, she will spend at least 30 plus years, at least 30 years of her life on that court ruling about the issues that affect you, your kids, your friends, your families, your grandkids. And she'll be doing that for 30 plus years. To give you an idea of people on the court, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who passed away just over a week ago now, was on the court for 27 years. Clarence Thomas, who, after a very contentious confirmation process, nomination and confirmation process, has been on the court now for almost 30 years. And he's probably asked only three questions in the entire 30 years that he's been on the court. Maybe five questions. (laughs) I think he asked two questions in consecutive cases a few months ago. So that's almost half his questions from 30 years on the bench. You think I'm joking about that? I am really not. He's only asked about five questions in the 30, near 30 years he's been on the court. And there are rumors and murmurings around the beltway that he may be retiring soon. After this election is over with. And certainly if, God forbid, Donald Trump gets in again, steals it again, shall I say, then Thomas would definitely resign. He would definitely resign. I I think that will happen. I know it's been rumored and it's murmured and it's this and it's that. And who knows, it could be all a bunch of bunk. But if it's not a bunch of bunk, I think he'll definitely go if this guy gets a second term. However... If Joe Biden wins this election, which I think is going to happen, but we cannot rest in our laurels with this, those of you who are Biden voters out there, then Clarence Thomas will probably stay on for a little while longer. But if he decides to resign and Biden has won the election, then there is a silver lining. However, however, the Democrats, the Senate Democrats, should be thinking about packing the court, adding Supreme Court justices. That is a way to offset this kind of thing. And for that to happen, the voters have to vote for the Senate to be Democratic, which means in at least 13 races, if not more, you flip these darn things to Democrats. Now, the Democrats only need four, a net gain of four Democratic senators on the night to take the Senate back. But I would really hope that voters vote many more in than just the four that they need. I would lovely, it would be lovely and optimal to have nine more Democratic senators. Because there are some votes that will require a supermajority, say 67 votes. So if the Democrats take back four, that's great. They've got control of the Senate. That's terrific. Then they can legislate. And if the House stays in Democratic hands, which is very important, and I think it will, then there can be some legislation passed that will benefit people federally. And it will actually come back to benefit the states because the states will get money. Congress provides some of that as well. And that is Congress. The Senate is Congress. The House is part of Congress. They're both Congress. But you also need to make sure that the White House turns Democratic. These things are connected. Elections have consequences. I know it's a line that you're fed up of hearing, but it's the truth. Elections really do have consequences. So, I mean, we really do have to do this. And the Senate Democrats should do whatever they can do to slow this nominee down and it is good to hear that some of these democrat democrats are not meeting with her some of the democrats in the senate are no i'm not going to be part of senator senator blumenthal yesterday out of connecticut he said richard blumenthal he said look i'm not going to meet with her i refuse to be a part of trying to legitimize this charade this farce I'm not going to participate in, in, in legitimizing it. And I think that's a good position. That's not about being symbolic. That's just strategic. That is taking a stand. you got to fight whether you have the votes or not. And the Republicans do it. And they're not called performers. When Obamacare was being thrown before the House, put before the House, I should say, you heard, you saw 
John Boehner. Hell no, you can't! Yeah, that's what he said. Hell no, you can't. And that's not a performance. That's a guy that's angry. That's a guy that's peed off, pissed. That's not a performance. I mean, again, this kind of nonsense about whether something's a performance or not. Well, when when someone has killed over 200,000 people, when someone has called U.S. Uh, military personnel suckers and losers, when someone calls a war hero someone who's not a real war hero because he, he got caught and then maligns him in death and then says all these things about John Dingle, who also was a war hero and implied that he was in hell. When someone says to people to go back to where they came from or calls Haiti a shithole country, excuse my French, I mean, at that point, when you, if you're asking us, well, if that's a performance or not, I mean, your head is in some other different kind of cloud because it's obvious what's going on. And let's not be seduced by all of these foolish pieces of dialogue and contraption and noise and the framing of things that are empty, that you're framing them around. This nominee is not there to be nice. She is not there to flaunt how her family is this and that and she's God-fearing. and that. That's not the point here. That's the optics. That is not what she's going to be doing. When she get, if she gets on that court, she's not going to be talking about her family and her fa- No, this is going to be about her opinions, the law in front of her, and what rationales she or any of the other Supreme Court justices are going to use to come up with where they are on the law and the facts in front of them and precedent. Roe v. Wade will be gone. And where the people go, well, is it going to be tinkered away? Is it? The fact of the matter is, is Roe v. Wade has been chipped away for years. You have some states where there's only one clinic for a woman to go to if they need to have an abortion. They have one clinic in the entire state. This is not, uh, this is, so to tell me, well, it, well, Roe v. Wade will still be there, but listen, look, Roe v. Wade is being chipped away anyhow, which is the horrible thing. And it's going to be gone completely under Amy Coney Barrett. You can bet your bottom dollar. And for those of you who have the Affordable Care Act, for those of you, you know, Obamacare, same thing. For those of you who have Obamacare, you will lose that under this judge if she gets confirmed as a justice. And that would be injustice. But it would be even more injustice if you sat there and did nothing. Which is why I strongly advise you right now, you must call these Republican senators at 202-225-3121 and call the ones who are not voting for the nominee before the election. And look, they may well vote for her after it, but right now, call Susan Collins, who's going to probably lose her seat, as the Republican in Maine, the senator there. Call Senator Collins and say thank you for for not falling in line with this. Call Senator Mikowski, the Republican in Alaska, 202-225-3121, and tell her, Senator, thank you for not going along with this vote before the election. Mitch McConnell knows that he can afford to have two senators in the Republican side not vote for this. He knows that. He knows that. He's got the numbers. Elections have consequences. That's the key here.
welcome back. So that's where I stand with the Supreme Court. And lastly, something I didn't mention in the last segment is people say, well, we shouldn't make it about the justice or the judge, rather, in this case, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. We shouldn't make it about her. It's about the nominee. It's about the, excuse me, it's about the process, not the nominee. Well, it's both. It is about the process, but it's also about the nominee. And I know the argument goes that, well, it would any anybody in this position would be. Yes, of course, anyone in that position would be there to try to overturn and get rid of Obamacare, get rid of Roe v. Wade, get rid of labor unions. Of, of course, get rid of the ability of people who are gay or lesbian, transgender, queer to marry. She'd get rid of all of this. Any of them would. But that's not the point. The point is not that anybody would. The point is that you've got to make a stand and fight this. Whether you have the votes or not. And I get it. The argument goes, well, we... And I said this to someone yesterday. Well, you know, Democrats have to play this in a particular way. Because, of course, Republicans will turn that around. And make that the biggest election issue. And then have half the voting electorate, the electorate, um, focus on that and not on the fact that 206,000 people have died. And there is a certain level of, well, will the Democrats fall into the trap? Well, will the Democrats put their foot in it? Well, will the Democrats trip over banana peel? Well, will the Democrats meekly submit to all of the Republican demands? I understand where that landscape is and where that thinking emanates from. But what I am saying, and what I think is even more important, is to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. (laughs) This can be done. And it can be done politically as well. You can criticize the process and also criticize the credentials And the views of the nominee, which is what the Democrats are going to do in the Senate when they have these hearings in a few weeks. They are going to do this. In fact, quite frankly, I think there's less mileage in them attacking this now. And more mileage in them just doing it. Tell tell the American public, like these senators are, Chuck Schumer did it yesterday, and so did Richard Blumenthal, the senators, the two Democratic senators, the the minority leader, uh, Schumer, and the other Democrat there, Richard Blumenthal. They both did it. They said, we're taking this to the American public. All you have to do is say that. All you have to do is say, a vote for this. And they did. Schumer did say, a vote for this nominee is a vote to get rid of Obamacare and to get rid of Roe v. Wade. And that's exactly what they have to say. And they did it the most succinctly. Don't spend time bellyaching about Mitch McConnell, as some people did last, some Democrats did, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the passing away of RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice. Don't go into how unfair, oh, he's wielding. Yeah, that's what Mitch McConnell does. That's what the Democrats need to learn how to do more effectively. I've said this before here. Take your eye off of that and focus on what. And again, I think they did this very well yesterday. Chuck Schumer and uh, Richard Blumenthal, the senators, uh, the Democratic senators. They did this very well. They were succinct. We're not going to go along with the charade. We're going to question the nominee. But this is a nominee and her views are the issue here. And that's what the focus has got to be. The views. In the middle of a a pandemic, she wants to get rid of Obamacare. In fact, these guys in the Republican Party have been trying to get rid of Obamacare for years, even before Donald Trump came along. And he's been doing it for four years, trying to get rid of it. And he's going to lie to you and tell you, oh, your pre-existing conditions will be safe with me. Yeah, right. But the Democrats, I think, the Senate Democrats are going about this the right way. Now, I hear, yeah, look, some Democrats are going to listen, are going to meet with her, fine. Fine, so what? So meet with her. If you want to meet with her and you're a Senate Democrat, you do that. But I think the vast majority of Senate Democrats are not meeting with her. And I think that's a good idea. And I don't think that, I don't care what Republicans do with that. I don't care. 
because I don't think that that is going to be the thing that tips this election. And I see pundits and commentators and they're saying, oh, well, don't get wrapped up in the Supreme Court. And I think that's true. I Look, I know that there are people who have written about that and there's a lot of, I agree, there's a lot of validity to that. But let's not act as if the Supreme Court is the only blooming thing in this election. <laughs> it's not the only issue. It is not the only blooming issue. And, 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 and that's the thing that just kills me. Even though I agree with the people who have written these columns, don't get trapped into this. I agree with that. Do not get suckered into the Supreme Court. But, that, but I am saying you fight. You can walk and chew gum. At the same time, Democrats must do that. And I think they're going to do it. And not only that, the Supreme Court is not the only issue, by far not the only issue. You know what the issue is? Health care. You know what the issue is? Donald Trump doesn't have a plan for it. You know what the issue is? Joe Biden wants to strengthen Medicare and, and, and Obamacare. Joe, and you know what the issue is? Social security. Social blooming security is going to be gone under Donald Trump in a second term. That's what the issue is. You know what the issue is? 206,000 people dead and counting from Donald Trump. Willful, willful, his willful, willful behavior. He killed these people. He didn't have to do it with his own bare hands. But when you lie to the American public while you're telling a respected author because you want to look good in his book, because you didn't talk to him the first book he did on you. So you want to get revenge. And you think that you can somehow outsmart Bob Woodward. So you tell him the truth for your own selfish ends. But you say, to hell with the damn country. To hell with America. To hell with the Americans. That's what Donald Trump is saying and doing and behaving like. Those are the issues. The issues of health care, the issues of veterans, the issues of seniors, the issues of climate. The Supreme Blumen Court is not the only Blumen thing on the Blumen ballot. I mean, that's the, see, that's the thing that really gets me. And then, oh, the Supreme Court, we can't just vote. We can't. Oh, we have to be careful. Oh, the Republicans don't give a crap about being careful. They care about being ruthless. They care about power. Or as I like to say, power. That's all they care about. And upending as many of your lives as possible. This is not about being nice. This is not about, well, we shouldn't talk about the Supreme Court so much. Well, Joe Biden is not emphasizing the Supreme Court. He's talking about it and then he's moving to the main issues. And while the Supreme Court is a damn important issue, it's not the only important issue out here. People's jobs have been lost. That is an immediate blooming thing, right? You have lost your job. Someone listening to me right now has lost their job. And they want to know who in the hell is going to get them a job and get them their job back. Well, maybe not the job they lost, but a job. Similar to it. Farmers are going to want to know what the hell's going on. All the subsidies that they're being paid. Why? You know, some of this stuff isn't getting to us. Why, why is this even happening? The whole the phony trade wars that Donald Trump did that hurt farmers in this country. Treaties that he's backed out of that affect you right now. Come on, folks. Do not get seduced. By one issue. And it's a bloody important issue. Because there are women in this country. Who may not be able to get an abortion. So it is damn important. And I'm not saying it's not. There are additional issues. That are also important. For the country. And they are happening right now. Someone listening to me right now. Does not have their job. They are unemployed. Someone listening to me right now has lost a loved one or knows of someone who lost a loved one to coronavirus. Someone listening to me right now 
is wondering about their social security. Donald Trump has told you that he wants to get rid of that. Oh, these entitlements. That's a code word for social security and Medicare. He has presented a fiscal 2021 budget. The fiscal year for 2021 begins on October 1st. That's only a few days from now. And in that budget is a cut of Social Security Disability Insurance Income, rather, SSDI, that Social Security Disability Income, and cuts on Medicare. This whole executive order he did a couple of months ago, which is a sham, but was about getting rid of the payroll tax. That, as I said many times, is to fund Medicare and Social Security. And by 2023, there'll be none. There'll be none of it left. And the SSDI will be gone in another six, seven months. Eight, you know, halfway through next year, rather. Those are the issues that are affecting millions of people in this country right now. And Joe Biden is going to hit those issues. And he's going to hit them in the debate, although climate must be on this de- one of these three debates. And it's a travesty, Chris Wallace, that you've not put a damn thing in there about climate. Are you blooming kidding me? You have wildfires all over this state here in California. You've got them going on in 10 or 12 other states, Pacific states. Colorado, you know, Washington, Oregon. All these, all these other states. And you're not putting climate on the agenda. You've got flooding going on in the south. Hurricanes all over the blooming place. They've run out of names to give them. I mean, Chris was, but again, you know, it's Trump TV, Fox News. You know, what do you expect? Chris was has interviewed Trump several times, including a month or two ago or back in July. And Chris was can be tough when he wants to be. And I'm hoping he is on Tuesday and that he asked Donald Trump the questions first. And at least in some of these instances, he gets the first question and not Joe Biden. Because then it's easy for Donald Trump. If Donald Trump gets the first question, we will see how he deals with it. Well, we know how he's going to deal with it. He's going to lie. But my whole thing about everything here is this nonsense about, well, we shouldn't. Oh, the Supreme Court. And look, maybe the Supreme Court has hurt. That issue has hurt some Democrats in the past. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But let me tell you something. The passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg has already energized millions of people, women and men, and people of all backgrounds are energized by not just her passing, but everything around it, as well as this virus, as well as the failures and the willful destruction. This is not even about failures. This is the willful destruction of the country by Donald Trump. This is the deconstruction of the administrative state by Donald Trump. This is him telling you the FDA can't be trusted. The voting can't be trusted. The post office can't be trusted because it's being slowed down. I mean, this is Donald Trump telling you that he hates you. He's telling you, this is Donald Trump telling you that he hates the country. He hates America. I don't know how much clearer it could be. Him siding with the racist who kill people in Charlottesville and the Nazis there and the, you know, the white racists and these, you know, this guy in uh, one of his supporters there in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who's really from Illinois, who shot two people dead with an AR-15 and then blew off the arm of someone else. And then the police allowed him to go over the state line back to Illinois. And he's still, we still, he's still involved in hearings to whether or not, Ooh, should Illinois, uh, uh, um, should uh, uh, should Illinois actually extradite him across the state line 25 miles away to Wisconsin where he murdered two people and blew the arm off another? Ooh, oh, we're going to have deliberations on this. Are you blooming kidding me? This week, he goes back into court if he hasn't already. And they're literally doing this. This guy's been free as a bird for six weeks now. Six blooming weeks or so. He's been free as a blooming bird. He's been free. Excuse me. It's not six weeks. It's about four weeks. A month. He's been free as a bird. Since he murdered these two people. He admitted it. He said, I just killed. I've just killed someone. 
It's like on video. I mean, I, it's just bizarre. That's the country you want to live in, really? I mean, th- this is just absolute madness. I mean, it's evil. And you've got people going, well, the Supreme Court, the Democrats can't be too careful. They've got to be wary. They can't do... No one ever tells that to the Republicans. And if they do, it's all this equivalency and excuse making. Which brings me to the corporate news media. And I'll talk about them next. Welcome back. So the mistake here, and I'm going to just do this really quickly here. The the mistake here, and it's not even a mistake here, I think it's by design. Cynical old me, right? <laughs> you haven't detected any trace of cynicism <laughs> over these last, uh, the last few months that I've been doing these episodes. You, you've not detected a, a single solitary syllable of cyn- cynicism anywhere, have you? Not a single solitary syllable of cynicism. Oh, I love the alliteration there. Oh. So allow me to put some more cynicism on the table. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Because the corporate news media in the United States has become an absolute joke now. Um, But it has been for a long time. And yes, I have in the past said, don't, don't watch it. But I've relented on that in the last few months. The last, so, you know, for lots of reasons. A, because I'm doing these podcasts now, so it's become purely selfish. But, of course, there's more than one way to access news. It's not just through watching the corporate news media. Um, and B, because it's important to get sound and put some sound on the table that you can hear. Because a, a lot of people don't watch CNN or MSNBC or, dare I say, Fox. A lot of people don't watch any of them. They don't have the time. They don't even have, well, not even. It's They, they don't have cable TV. They don't have TV. Some people just do not have televisions. Because what's the point? You've got a phone, you've got an iPad, you've got your laptop, whatever. You can watch TV or watch stuff on it, right? And and, uh, look, that's just a fact. There's a lot of households that don't have televisions. And I'm not just talking people under 30. I'm talking about people over 40 and over 50 and who don't have TVs in their households. They have, you know, radios, they have books, they have lots of other things. And believe me, that's a better option than sitting in front of a television um, you know, because a lot of this stuff, and I and I'm not saying that as someone who does, because I don't sit in front of the TV all day. Um, I, I do like to collect news off my DVR, and I will tape some of these things. And there's things on there. I will bring them on social media or, or do them in real time, because I think it's important. A lot of people don't see these clips. A lot of the people who I, I think some of the people who may listen to me right now do not know of certain clips. And I've got some clips to play coming up in the next few days that that will, you know, that you may not be aware of. And most people don't watch cable news. They they really genuine genuine generally do not. I mean they may watch local news, but they you know, I mean, or maybe vice versa. But the point is is the corporate news media, the cable news media, has been atrocious in the way they've covered Donald Trump. They've done this for five years now, and in fact by extension forty years, because they are his friend and he is theirs. He is a part of the media. He had been. He had a deal with NBC Universal. He no longer does. He, of course, had a TV series called The Apprentice, The Celebrity Apprentice as well. He was on that thing for years. It had high ratings. People watched it. Maybe you watched it. I never had watched it. I've never watched The Apprentice. I never watched The Celebrity Apprentice. I can cover myself in glory. Aren't I a good person? That's not the point of this. The point of this is... (laughs) The point of this right now is to say that now that this guy has polluted the White House, covering him as if he's some ordinary person, oh, he's just this ordinary candidate. He's trying to be reelected. You can't cover him that way. And it will be interesting to see how Chris Wallace on Tuesday does this as a moderator, because I think that's going to be very important. Even though there are very few undecideds left, and even though these debates, I don't think, are going to sway a blooming thing or anyone. Because their people's minds have been made up, folks. 27 states, as I've already said, are already voting. So debate or no blooming debate, people's votes are already in the can. 
And I mean in the ballot box, okay, not in the garbage can. I know Bill Bob would love to romanticize with you and make you think that nine blooming ballots thrown away by a Republican, by the way, by a Republican in a Republican blooming district, that that somehow the Democrats did that. Ooh, there's voter fraud. This is all orchestrated. And Bill Barr is going to continue to do stuff like this, which makes him a dangerous individual. He did this with the Mueller report in 2019, when before the report was even released to the public, he's putting out a four-page summary. Now, why the hell do we need a four-page summary of a darn thing from Bill Barr? Why? Well, he wants to prejudice your view before you even get to read the darn thing. The seven people in the country who read it. That's what the whole thing about that was. And he's doing it again. He wants to prejudice you into thinking that there really is voter fraud going on. Even though we've had a billion pieces of evidence, studies, everything that says that voter fraud does not happen. It really doesn't happen. It's point zero 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 five eight, according to a Harvard study. And according to, I mean, this is just garbage. And these guys love to maximize the minimum. That's what these Republicans do. They maximize the minimum and minimize the maximum. That's what Republicans have done forever. Since the 60s. But especially now, it becomes even more toxic and dangerous. And so you're going to see these stunts again. Close to election day, you'll see another stunt. And after election day, especially, that's where the stunts really will happen from Bill Barr. Trust me on that. You heard it here, first, second, or third, or last. But the corporate news media have got to stop covering this guy as if he is someone who is legitimate. As someone I spoke to yesterday agreed with me on. You have to stop covering him like this and cover him like the authoritarian that he is. This is the conversation I have with somebody. And, and, and we both agree. We, the, this is somebody who is a dictator. I've said this for a long time about him. Donald Trump is a dictator. He's an autocrat. He's an authoritarian. He ain't performing Jack. He's doing it. And he's doing it to scare you. He's doing it to deter you from voting. He's doing it because he can. And also because he is a danger to the country. You can't tell me that him with Putin is a performance. See, damn it with this stuff about performing, right? Because two blooming years ago, did you remember? Two years ago when he was in Helsinki, that was not a blooming performance. That was him throwing the United States intelligence community under the bus, And for that matter, the country under the bus, throwing America under the bus on the world blooming stage. That's not a performance that happened for real. And I guarantee you, if Barack Obama did that, no one would be having these debates about performance versus is it for real? Nobody would. If Hillary Clinton had become president and she was pulling this kind of nonsense, no one would be sitting around talking about Well, head scratch, head scratch, head scratch. Is this a performance or is this head scratch, head scratch, head scratch? Is this real? (laughs) Why, Why do people engage in these kinds of phony debates that that shouldn't even be had? I mean, this is all noise and the corporate news media is all about noise and ratings. And not about issues. I've said this before and you know this before. This is not about issues for them. It's about how many eyeballs and advertisers they can get. That's what this is about. And so they cover this guy as if he's someone who isn't an authoritarian. Who isn't a danger. Oh, well. Well, his supporters say this. I don't care that his supporters don't believe a video that has been, that is real and they believe the one that's been doctored. I don't care about that. That doesn't mean anything. It's noise. I've told you, and you know this, you know this, dear listener, that this is a cult. And they're not even talking about that. They're not even giving you background on it. 
They're not even doing that. They're what the corporate news media loves to do is put a magnifying glass right up to your face, right up to the thing that they're studying. But they never pull back from that magnifying glass. They never pull away. They never pull out from that close-up shot to reveal the rest of the issue, the context around it. They never do. And that's, that's deliberate. Because if they would have the conversation about the cult, then they would be able to, and if they were real about that and they pulled back the camera and stopped zooming in on some Trump supporters all the time, and if they pulled back and saw what was going on around that and said that this is a cult and then said, well, in 1978, Jim Jones and Jonestown. Well, in the 1990s, a cult in San Diego where people ended their lives covered in purple shrouds. Go and look that up, folks. I am not making it up. Or Waco, Texas. David Koresh, 1993 or whatever it was, during the Clinton years, during Bill Clinton. And Janet Reno took so much heat for that as the Attorney General. And the burning of the complex, the compound in Waco. Cults, right? But you see, the corporate news media deliberately does not choose to talk about that. Why? As I told you, ratings and money and, you know, Les Moonves, I played the audio for you. I'm not going to play it again here. I'll just say it. It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. That is what's going on. Right? Because if you were alerted, if the, not you per, per se, but if the average individual out here who doesn't have access to all manner of things, but has a TV set maybe or doesn't, but, you know, if the average person were to put those things together, they would see that these aren't just supporters. These are cult members and that this stuff is dangerous, dangerous. Now, yes, they talk about the fact that a lot of people who support Trump don't wear masks and they're in these rallies. But that's the point, right? They don't talk about how dangerous that is. I mean, they do, but they don't put that in the context of all these other cults. I mean, that's just the thing. And if the viewer was educated to that, maybe they may have a different outlook. Maybe they may not. But at least it's put out there in front of them to make the decision on whether they think that these people are stark raving nuts, are cultists, or are good, decent people who are supporting someone that they believe is somehow a god. <laughs> Which, of course, he is not. Never mind his pronouncements about being the chosen one. I mean, come on, this guy is illegitimate. I am the chosen one. What the hell? This guy doesn't even believe in the Bible. He holds up a Bible. When was the last time he saw the inside of a blooming church? And they had to disinfect it before and after he left the blooming place or arrived at the place. This guy doesn't believe in church. He doesn't believe in anything except himself. And he barely believes in that. I mean, this guy hates people. He has a completely white heart. No, not a black heart, a white heart. There's nothing there. It's a blank slate. A blank slate. I mean, that's what that's what this guy is. And no one's covering him like that in the media. Jeffrey Tubin, good on him for saying what he said. And um Here's what he said, actually. But uh, can we also just do our job as journalists and talk about some of the lies he just told? I mean, the 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 idea that the I the problem with the Iowa caucuses was that they were corruption and mail in ballots. It was a caucus. There were no mail in ballots. I mean, you know, this is I mean, the, the lying he has done about the, our election processes are so pernicious and so constant. And I think we should just try to do our jobs at least a little bit. I, I know it's hard because he tells so many lies, but I mean, that cascade of lies he just told about mail-in ballots is something that we should acknowledge and do our best to try to monitor. 
You're absolutely right. Uh, we, we get used to all of that, uh, the distortions. Uh, when he said we're leading in Pennsylvania, leading in Florida, we're leading everywhere. Uh, well, according to almost all of the polls, that not not necessarily true. Uh, it looks like there are very close contests in those key battleground states in Florida and Pennsylvania, although some of the most recent polls in Pennsylvania show that Biden is ahead. And you're right, as far as the ballots are concerned, uh, there were a few, a handful of ballots thrown into a garbage can by mistake. There wasn't any crime there, right? The, there, there was no crime there. And, you know, he tosses off this thing about a thousand ballots here, a thousand ballots here. That is not true. That is not true. And what he said about the Iowa caucuses right, was hold on beyond for a moment. bizarre. Uh, the Senate uh, Democratic leader, the minority leader, Chuck Schumer, is making his. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, stand by. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, Chuck Schumer is making his statement. You know, Jeffrey Tubin's correct. Uh, just CNN was just really bizarre, more bizarre than usual. Yesterday, Saturday, they were more bizarre than usual. I mean, these guys were just ridiculous. Their journalism sucked. And Jeffrey Tubin, who's a regular contributor, was essentially telling them that right to their face on their air. Thank you, Jeffrey. At least somebody cares about the truth. We're getting so used to what he says. No, we're not getting used to it, Wolf Blitzer. By the way, Wolf Blitzer, can I just say this? Wolf Blitzer yesterday on that same program said that it was a moving and powerful ceremony. That's what he said about Trump announcing Amy Coney Barrett. A powerful and moving ceremony? Really? There was nothing moving or powerful about it. It was poisonous and putrid. You know, do your job in the corporate news media and do it on election night because you have to continue to tell people right now that this election will not be decided on election day or election night. Don't do it casually. What they've been doing is casually. Well, there's a real possibility that it won't be decided on election night. And then they get the pundits on to reinforce that. But what these anchors need to do is make that clear. Directly. Directly. And that's what they need to do. And they need to be responsible on election night. Do not call this blooming race. Please. Like they did 20 years ago and Fox News said, oh, yeah, well, there, yeah, well, Bush won. And then all these blooming networks changed their blooming projections. And one of the and the guy who ran Fox News election desk was actually the cousin. The cousin of Jeb Bush. (laughs) Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Hardly anybody. That was in Fahrenheit. 9-11, 9-11, Michael Moore's movie from 20, 2004. It's just crazy. It's crazy. The corporate news media cannot afford that madness because democracy really is at stake. And now white people are really getting it, that this is serious. And black folk have been shouting about this. We've been shouting about this for centuries. But now the rest of uh, the rest of you out there Now you understand what we've been telling you and died telling you for centuries. Elections have consequences. The media and its behavior has consequences. The news media must responsibly cover election night and cover the results and make it very clear on election night and before election night at the start of election night that the election will not be decided today on election day on November 3rd when that happens. You have to say that in the media, in the corporate news media, cable, everywhere, so that you don't have megaphone mouthpieces like the guy in the White House screaming because he's going to. And I dare say that when he does, you cover that responsibly and stop giving him all this airtime. In fact, I wouldn't be giving him any airtime 
from November 3rd onwards until this election is actually resolved in terms of the counts being done and every vote tabulated counted. And I would have him embargoed off Twitter. I would embargo his account for all that time. I really would. Twitter's not going to do it. But I would recommend that that be done so that he didn't spread all his lies on Twitter or anywhere else and declare a victory, which he's going to do. But the media has to be very responsible about they handle it, how they handle this, just like Chris Wallace does about how he deals with this debate on Tuesday. I think I have no, no question about Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden's going to have a very good debate night. The issue is how is... Chris Wallace is going to handle Donald Trump when he keeps talking and lying. Is he going to fact check him? Are there going to be fact checkers in the media doing things in in real time? I think there should be. And I have a feeling that there's going to be. Certainly Daniel Dale is going to have his work cut out for him. As will I, because I'll be doing some of this myself on election night. Excuse me, on debate night. So if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter... You can follow me at the Popcorn R-E-E-L. I will be doing some real-time fact-checking of everything that's being said. And if Joe Biden lies, I will do the same. I will do the same. But the person who is lying like a rug is clearly Donald Trump. He's told over 23,000 lies since he polluted the office in January 2017. So he's going to lie some more. A lot more. You thought Mitt Romney was a liar in 2012 in the debates? Caught Obama off guard in that first debate? Wait until you experience, and you experienced it last time. Wait until you see this during the debate on Tuesday. Get out there and early vote, please. Do it in person, preferably. Very important. Do not waste a second. 37 voting days. 27 states voting early. And they're doing that right this second. And 50 states. All of us. And of course, Washington, D.C. We can't forget D.C., which should, by the way, be a state. And Puerto Rico should, by the way, be a state. And I will actually put the... um, Website for the overseas voters. I will put that in my liner notes. I'm sorry. I just don't have the time. I'm running out of time here uh, on this edition. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I will uh, put an insert in here as well um, on the uh, website and the link for it uh, on the liner notes for overseas voters. Some really good, reliable information. Thank you very much for listening for this, to this edition, I should say, of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.